So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are here to do the second part of my quarter year class. Um, this actually is, was originally designed to be done all at one time. And the first time we tried it, it was just way too much information. So we have split it up into two classes. The first class, um, what we talked about was the different models for the courtier, what the courtiers were, um, who participated, and then we looked at three different models for what the courtiers were doing and how they were doing it. Um, we have, uh, we looked at uh, Castiglione's The Book of the Courtier, which a lot of people will be familiar with. We also looked at Machiavelli's prints, and we looked at Christine de Passant's The Treasure of the City of Ladies. So, what we're doing this class is we're gonna start delving in deeper into what the courtiers were actually doing, what they were expected to know, what they were expected to do, and why. Um, we're not going to go, go into a lot of depth as to specific skills, although we'll talk a little bit about them. Um, and my hope is that we will continue this series of, of classes on, we start getting more in depth and start doing more of a roundtable discussion on um, specific qualities and specific skills. So what we'll start with is um, the courtier. Let's, let's go ahead and back up just a little bit and talk about what the courtiers were again so that that's in fresh everyone's mind. So the, the strict definition is they were people who attended court. They were the people who were waiting on the nobility. Um, Lords, barons, dukes, duchesses, princes, kings, and queens. The, uh, these could, could range anywhere from other nobility to, to uh, paid spots on their staff, such as clerks or gentlemen or ladies of the chamber. And then there would also be the people who were attending on them to, to make court life more interesting. These are the, the artisans, the painters, uh, the people who are helping make things run errands and make things operate. If you were the king, your courtiers would be nobility. The nobility, the nobles' courtiers could be lesser nobility and uh, lesser uh, lesser children of nobles that did not have titles of their own but were armigarius. And then down to the barons and baronesses who could have uh, lords and ladies or 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 no titles at all. Um, you, you often see, even in the presence of the dukes and duchesses, people with no titles, such as Leonardo da Vinci or Benvenuto Cellini, who were artists and were part of the courtier and of the court life, even though they, weren't, they did not have uh, titles of their own to start with, although a lot of them had titles by the end of, of their lives. The big question about all this is, why do we care? Um, and that is something that, that is going to... Uh, it is a much longer conversation than we're going to give it right now, but we're going to talk just briefly about why this is important and why we care. So particularly if you are studying the, the 15th and 16th century, this is the heyday of the courtier. This is the time when we are starting to buck the great chain of being and trying to advance ourselves beyond our place by attaching ourselves to people of, of higher status. Um, we're also, if you are a clerk, this is also how you would make your livelihood and be able to advance yourself through your positions and through your uh, job assignments, as well as, as a painter or an artist, um, this is how you would get patronage as far as someone to support your work and support you while you make your beautiful art. So there's reasons for it. It's also started, uh, particularly Castiglione's model, which is what I'm gonna, who, who I'm gonna primarily focus on today. Um, Castiglione's model very much is focused on the nobility, but it didn't stay that way. Um, very rapidly, the book was being um, mass produced and was being translated into multiple languages. And the focus of the book changed a little bit and it became more than just how to, to um, be a courtier. It became a book on how to be a noble, but it also became a book about how to deal with the nobility and became a finishing manual of sorts for, for people around, around all across Europe on how to behave. Uh, it is the foundation of our modern liberal arts. So it is important to know where that came from, but it is also important for 16th century persona 
to understand how they were supposed to behave, what they were supposed to be doing. Um, so one of the things that I'm very interested in is persona studies. And with, when you're looking at that, it's very easy to get to be in persona at an event when you're doing activities that they would have done. When you're talking about activities they would have participated in, suddenly it becomes much easier to be in persona and to get those real moments that a lot of us look for. So that's why I view this as being important. It also benefits us to understand what they were thinking and why they thought the way they did. Um, and that is also going to be a much more in-depth conversation in a future class. Um, because not only do we have all the information um, about the courtier and what the, they should be reading and what they should be doing and what they should be thinking, when you start analyzing the books itself, both the Treasure of City of Ladies and the Book of the Courtier, you start getting a, a glimpse of what they were reading and what historic works uh, they were focusing on and gives us an opportunity to 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 read and study the same works they were reading and studying in an effort to understand how they viewed the world better. Um, that's kind of a, a, a synopsis of where what we did last last time and where we're going this time before we actually start getting into the nuts and bolts. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, just unmute your mic and we can go from there and Philip, I don't know if you have the ability to see chats. What I'll do is any chats that come through, I will break in and let you know in a timely fashion, if that's okay with you. Oh, that would be great. No, I do not see the chats. Okay. Okay. So going on into what we're going to be t discussing today, the book we're going to be discussing today is the Book of the Courtier, but we're specifically dealing with with Thomas Hobie's translation of the book. It was translated into English in 1561. So the English translation is period. And unlike modern translations of books, there was no attempt to try and keep it exact as to what they were doing or to stay exactly true to the Italian model. Hobie did a lot of anglicizing the work and making it for the, for the, the, the Englishman. Um, because of that, we get a little more glimpses to what was happening during the during the, the the late 16th century of in England, but it also gives us a, a little different view of what was happening with the courtier because he is bringing it away from just the nobility and making it a little more accessible to anybody who is able to read the work. Um, one of the things that he did that was phenomenal was at the very end of the book. He added a list of the chief qualities and conditions in a courtier. So he broke everything out, reduced them to a sentence, and put it in the back of the book. So he gave us a cheat sheet, which is one of the greatest contributions he, he made to, to, to this field. Um, he gave us a cheat sheet of, what, of how they should behave, what they should be doing, and what activities they should be doing, and how they should be doing it. And that's kind of what we're going to focus on a little bit today. Now, Hobie has stayed with Castiglione's model of splitting up the qualities of the male courtiers and the female courtiers. And there still is a strong sexual bias there. However, as we talked about in the last class, Christine de, Pitt de Besson, in her book, The Treasure of the City of Ladies, which was about 100 years before the courtier, um, the book of the courtier from Castiglione, Christine de Pissant has given us a model of the female courtier that is much more like Castiglione's male model. For her princess and for her duchesses and for her countesses, she is still advocating a model that is very similar to, to Castiglione's female courtier, except that she is saying that they need to be well-educated and that they need to be well, up, well informed on political matters and politics because any princess or duchess who is not up on politics um, risks damaging herself and her husband's reputation. Um, and particularly when she starts dealing with, uh, with baronesses and countesses on country estates, 
or ladies of country estates, she starts giving them much more of the male qualities, even going so far as to saying they need to, to be able to wear harness, they need to be able to fight, they need to be able to lead men, so that they are not dependent on some man leading their forces for them in defense of their home if, when their husband is away at war with the king. So they believe that they needed, in order to protect themselves and their husband's interests, they needed to be able to run their own estate, keep their own books, lead their own men into battle. So because of that, what we're going to focus on right now is just the male qualities for the courtier out of, um, out of Hobie's translation of Castiglione, because it apply, if we take Christine de Passant, it also applies to women just as equally. Um, and again, I keep saying this, uh, one of the classes that I'd like to do in the future is a very in-depth discussion just on Christine de Passant and, and how different she views women compared to, to, to the rest of Europe. But that's, that's another conversation. So the chief conditions and qualities of the courtier is about 130 um, different aspects of what the courtier should be doing how they should be behaving. And it also goes in something that we can use it for as a blueprint as to the activities we should learn and the conversations we should be having, but also what we should be careful of. And I believe that we can break them down into, well, they really break down into five categories. Um, once I get rid of two of them, I'm going to say there's only three categories, but in reality, there's five. The first one is physical attributes of the courtier, and these are things that we can't control. It's that we should be tall of stature, but not too tall, that we should be physically fit, and it's a lot of things in there that, that we can't help. So I'm going to throw those, those four or five qualities that he mentions right at the up front. We're just going to ignore those today. Um, We've got skills and knowledge, and these are, are what you should know and what you should be capable of doing. We have personal behavior, and these are how you should behave. The activity, things that you need to be aware of about, about comporting yourself in public. Just, the next thing is activities, and these are things that you should be doing with other people in public. Um, and a lot, of, and we're, a lot of them are available in the SCA, and but not all of them are going to be available at every event. And if you, and we'll talk in a second about not trying to do everything and, and a story about that. Um, and then the, the fifth thing is how to behave in front of your Lord or your Prince or your King. And these are specific behaviors about people who are above your station and that you are in service to. Um, we're going to lump those and the personal behaviors together. And I'm just going to label them PLQs. So peer like qualities. Um, because that's something in the society we discuss. It's something that is important to us. And the, uh, the book of the courtier gives us a blueprint for exactly what that is and historic models for how to behave. Um, skills and knowledge we're going to keep and activities we're going to keep, although skills and knowledge and activities kind of cross back and forth. Um, so one of the things that we're going to talk about is it is almost impossible for one person to be able to do all 138 of these things. Um, and what they are giving us is a plutonic ideal. This is the courtier in its perfect form, in its purest form. This is not the practical application of it, although we're going to talk about that. But we can also break these down into more things, such as the activities. We can break them down into activities that they did in the evening, activities they did during the day, and war in warfare activities or martial activities. And there's a lot of crossover between those. But there's enough of them that they don't need to be done every day. But I am going to advocate that if you are going to be a courtier, that you need to have some martial skills. You need to have of some form. And we'll talk about what, what, what's available to us, according to the courtier. Uh, we'll also talk about your afternoon skills, things during the day that would have been done in the company of others as pastimes. And then also your evening activities that would have been done so that you can participate in them. You don't have to have all those skills, but you need one or two of each of them in order to, to really be able to participate well with what's happening. 
So again, I'm going to stop there and see if we've got any commentary or any questions before we start going in more depth into the different parts of the activities. We haven't had any comments or questions come in through me, buddy. Okay. Well, hopefully I haven't put everybody to sleep already. Um, so let's go ahead and let's talk about the individual skills. So we're going to start with skills and knowledge because that's the easy place to start. And uh, Hobie lists, and Hobie has broken out quite a few and he's added things that are not in the text. And he's added things that weren't in the original book. So I wanna be upfront with you about that, which is why we're focusing on his list because that gives us a nice set to go from. But it, again, it's already starting to, to evolve past where Castiglione started. Um, so one of the things that he that Hobie talks about with knowledge is that you need to be well spoken, and because the book was written in uh, in Italian, he uh, Castiglione assumed it was going to be Italian, but because this book the translation is English, Hobie assumes that it's going to be English. That's going to be your primary language, um, and he talks about being able to speak in other tongues. So. You, they advocate uh, Spanish, they advocate French, particularly if you're in England, those are, are very important languages for you to know and to be able to communicate with, particularly if you're dealing with the courts as those will appear at the courts on a regular basis. And it's important to know particularly what other people and other ambassadors are, are saying about the situation or about you. And that leads into the next converse, to the next thing that you should skill and knowledge you should have, which is you should be up on 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 current politics. Um, matters of state are important, particularly if you're at court, particularly if you're noble. Matters of state can be life and death for you at times. It is important to be up on what's happening. Um, as a courtier to someone else, uh, Philippe would have courtiers. But Philippe would also be a courtier to someone else. I'm a courtier to my to my baroness. It says I'm also a courtier to their majesties because I'm in fealty to their majesties. So it is important not only for me to know politics that affect me directly, but it's also to my benefit to, to keep up with politics that affect my patrons, so that I can give information to them and help them as well. Um, other specific skill, other knowledge and skill starts blurring and, and sometimes it's difficult to know where to put it is, is knowing how to play chess well, is that a skill, is that knowledge, or is that an activity? And I guess the answer is all three in, in, in a way. Um, but then when we start talking about some skills, uh, skills are something where, well, I'm sorry, I, my free form of consciousness gets, gets really bad. Let, let's, let's stick with, 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 with skills and knowledge right now. Um, one of the things that you need, that the talks that you need to know how to do is how to paint or to draw. And there's a lot of reasons for this. And one that they give in the book, The Courtier, is because it's pretty and it's beautiful and that enhances any court. But the other thing they talk about is being able to, to draw out fortifications for war. So it's one of the, things that you can do on the military side as a scout to, or as someone visiting a city is to draw plans of the city, to draw plans of the, of the fortifications of that city for, for future military purposes. It says, and this is something that even if you're not a fighter, you don't do armored fighting, armored combat, you don't do, you, you don't do rapier. It is an activity that is of martial bent that is invaluable that is important to do and important to know um, and I'd point out that that Leonardo da Vinci as far as we know never picked up arms or fought in a tournament and, and I, I would pretty much say that, it, that he didn't do that um, however we know that he did a lot of inventing of military equipment we also know that he did a lot of drawing of, of city fortifications and maps and and those are important because those contribute to the military end, even if you're not, they are not carrying a weapon. Um, so knowledge of drawing and of painting is important. Um, 
skills such as, as being able to, to read and write are assumed with the courtier, but Hobie does mention them. Um, one of the things that the, the, the knowledge that they also do, it go, starts blending back into the activities, and that is you should know music, uh, music theory, you should know how to sing, you should know how to play an instrument. And part of the reason why is when we start getting into skills and activities, those are evening activities that they would do to entertain themselves among the court, particularly at Urbino. And there are several other um, examples of court life where the noble is, has their, their attendants and their guests around and they are entertaining for the evening. And that entertainment could be dancing, that entertainment could be playing music, it could be singing, it could be telling stories. So being skilled in one of those activities is important in order for you to help participate in entertaining your patrons and their guests. Um, more than one is always ideal, but as again, we've talked about this being a plutonic ideal, this isn't something that everyone has to have everything, but you need to be able to participate with one or two of those items. The list of um, chief qualities and conditions of the courtier is in a handout that I had put on the, um, on the event page for, for this class so that people had access to them. Does anybody have any questions about the, uh, about the, about skills or knowledge, anything that, if, if you had a chance to read through them, anything that caught your attention or that you want to discuss specifically before we go on. So, so let's talk about, let's talk about skills and not about, I'm sorry, but let's talk about activities. So this is something that we do a lot of with the SCA is what we go to events and do things. And so this particularly gets a lot of focus in the SCA, and I, I think that's justified. And gives us an idea of what we should be doing. Um, one of the things that I had talked about just a moment ago is that the activities can really be broken up into three, to three types. They've got activities that they do during the day, activities that they do in the evening, and then they've also got martial. Sometimes those martial activities are, are tournaments, which are fun activities, not, not warfare, but some of it is also warfare. Um, so let's talk about Marshall for a moment. One of the things that Castiglione in the Italian, his original Italian version of the courtier talks about is specifically about the chief profession of every courtier and every noble is military. And because they are expected to be able to go to war with their king or their noble that they are supporting. Um, Castiglione was known for battle. He had a harness and fought in tournaments. He was also an ambassador for the Duke of Urbino, and the Duke of Urbino was a courtier and a vassal to, to other people, including the Pope. So it's one of those things that although Castiglione wouldn't necessarily go into to conflict on his own right, he was expected to be able to raise levies and go, from his county and go to war with his, with his duke when his duke needed to do so. And that was um, a profession. And so he, he, he knew arms and he knew how to do that. So being ready for war was a big thing for him. However, there's a lot more to being ready for war than just having the equipment and being ready to ride off. You need to know what you're doing. And how they learned that was through, through the study of arms. And the, the, the Book of the Courtier talks very specifically about a couple of things that you needed to be able to do as part of that. And we're going to, to talk about specifically dealing with, 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 with the fighting, and that is um, to set out oneself in feats of chivalric of chivalry in open shows, well provided a horse and harness, well trapped and armed, so that he may show himself nimble on horseback. Um, it talks about not being the last to appear in the lists or the jousts, and to have in triumphs calmly, calmly armor 
faces, scarves, trappings, liveries, and other fence, things of sightly and merry colors, and rich to behold, with witty posies and pleasant diverses to lure unto him chiefly the eyes of the people. So it does talk about. Oh, I think that's thunder. Okay, well, I'm outside. We'll see how this is going to go. Um, it does talk specifically about um, showing in tournaments and participating in tournaments and being sightly in those tournaments as far as your appearance. Um, they also discuss in the book about being proficient with weapons and horseback and at the, the and at the uh, fighting at the barricade, as well as as jousting at the tilt, jousting with, at the yard and doing tilting. Um, it also talks about fencing with all manner of weapons. So you you get a little bit of of all of that in SCA armored combat and fencing. But that's not the only place where it discusses. It also talks in its daytime activities. It talks about doing archery. Because as we know, England was big on archery and big in, on archers and warfare. And so participating in archery is, is very much a martial activity and very much something that would take care of our requirements of being martial and being ready to go to war for our gang. Um, something that is not mentioned in Castiglione's version of the Courtier, but is mentioned in Hobie's, Hobie's translation, is the throwing of the spear or dart. So throwing weapons is an activity that I personally dearly love, um, but it is also would count in the minds of the courtier as martial activities. Those are, th ex those are skills that are pastimes during the day, but they are also things that are done um, as part of war and participate. And in the SCA, although they're not done on the battlefield, a lot of the wars do have war points for them, so they are still participation. Um, I would even go a little farther than what Hobie has done because he, of course, didn't envision the SCA and what we do. But at wars, there are often war points for service. And, there, and that is perfectly acceptable under the, the courtier as to serving your king and, and going to war with them. And what certainly fit is as a martial application, in my opinion, doing service for the service war point at like Kinzik or Gulf Wars or even Williams. Um, that is something to, that, that I don't know people's opinions on that, if that's something that you think would apply or wouldn't apply. Um, I'm not sure who all is on the class, but I know there are several people who are going to be joining the class who have as much knowledge, if not more knowledge, on some of these subjects than I do. So you, you're welcome to voice your opinion if you are so inclined. Um, hey, Philip, I think that like, yes. you know, armor, like if, you, if you're fighting in harness, somebody has to take care of the armor, the weapons, the repairs. So I would think a swordsmith or an armor, that's the perfect, you know, arm, the army has to have those functions to continue. So yeah, I would think so. Absolutely. And we know that the, the Medici's had a personal armor that was part of their retinue. That, that made them the beautiful things that, that only made things for the Medici. Um, Benvenuto Cellini is a goldsmith and he was a courtier to, to kings and popes and was, was very much making things for them. So yeah, uh, doing armoring and providing services on the battlefield and um, I have no idea if we're going to ever see water bearers on the field again, depending on what's going on with the health conditions and everything, but, but even water bearing would be would be a service to the community and a martial activity that is necessary and certainly supporting the army and supporting your king. Well, I mean, if an army is on campaign, somebody has to eat or you don't have enough energy to actually go fight. An army, you know, one of the things is an army travels on its stomach. You have to have people who cook and prepare the food. And to be truthful, like I retired from the army, the quality of your food affects the morale of the army greatly. Absolutely. Um, and we know from, from several examples that, that people, the, the, at, during this time period, particularly the 16th century, a lot of the camp followers were, were craftsmen and wives doing laundry, cooking food, doing the things that needed to be done following their husbands to war, particularly at the, soldier, at the, the common soldier level. 
and would be back in camp. So, but those are things that are necessary in order for the war to continue and be successful. I've got a question I can pass along to you. Uh, this That'd is be great. From Daniel Smith, he says in Hobie's list of martial activities, he mentions, quote, to keep a passage or, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, it's S-T-R-E-I-C, end quote, and he wants to know what that is. I'm not sure. Um, let's see if I can find it real quick. What was the spelling on that? Hey, Philippe, can you hear me? Yeah, this I can bad. hear you. Okay. Yeah, it's in Hobie's, uh, it's part of the, uh, the list of, you know, martial activities that he says these things are to be done in open sight to delight the commune, the common people with all. It's yes. right between these, it says to fight at barriers, and it's right above to play at Jogo de Cane. Yeah, and, and the Jogo de Cain is something that, that, that most of the scholars are still arguing about what that is. Um, right, I've heard that debate. Yeah, so, okay. Huh. Did you find it? No. Okay, so what it actually says is to keep a passage or strict. And, and like I said, the, the passage is kind of the standard, you know, anglicized uh, French spelling. And then it definitely mm -hmm. says or, O-R. And then it says S-T-R-E-I-C-T. I just don't know what that word is even supposed to mean. Yep, and I am still not even finding it. I'm looking through the okay. section. The you know what? Don't worry about it. Let's not spend a whole lot of time on it. I just thought okay. if you knew what it was, you could give me a, an easy answer. I don't offhand. So that's something that I will make a note about and I will look that up because that is that is something we want to look at. Okay. Yeah. It's probably something simple. It's just, you know, in 16th century English types face. So who knows? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and and okay, there's thanks. several things like that. With, with the Jogo de Cain, the only reference we can find to it in academic works and in um, and internet searches and in anything that I have tried to find has been the reference from Hobie. Um, the, the literal translation seems to be, it seems to be Portuguese and it looks like it's the game of the cane and there is some thought that it could be a single stick, um, but nobody knows for sure. So there, there's a lot of things in there that are kind of Obtuse. Yeah. Well, from, an, from a 16th century English perspective, I suppose some version of what we now call single stick would make a lot of sense because uh, they were very fond of that. Absolutely. And it, 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 it could be, one, again, it's a, it's a sport that became very popular in the very late 16th century and early 17th century and, and bars among drunken people. So it's, it is it is a martial activity that can be, that can also be a, a, a sport. So they, uh, okay, okay, thanks. One of the things that we've talked a little bit about the martial activities and how that applies. Let's talk a little bit about the daytime activities. And most of these were considered either training for martial activities or up to martial activities themselves, such as throwing the stone or the bar. And uh, anybody who's gone to the Scottish Highland Games are going to be familiar with a lot of these activities. Um, the, particularly with a stone, it was a physical trait, but it was also considered training for war. It talks about vaulting and wrestling, which were trainings for horseback and for war. Um, and so they were sports and they were considered good nature, but they were also getting you ready for, for warfare. Um, 
it, they talk specifically about daytime activities, about hunting, and about the importance of being able to be good in the saddle to go on the hunt and be able to hunt with a hawk or a hound. And then you are in situations where you're going to be with other nobles doing the same and having a uh, an enjoyable afternoon. But it, you have to. That's also training for warfare, being able to ride in all sorts of conditions and being able to to keep your seat and respond quickly to 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 different activities going on, particularly if you're hunting something dangerous like war. Um, most of the SCA, those are activities that we can't do. Um, there, there are some co hound coursing that takes place, which is kind of cool. And if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend it. Um, but we're not going to be actually going hunting. Uh, but, but hound coursing, equestrian activities, those are things that we can do as part of, of, of what we're doing and who we are in order to, to participate in martial activities and in the SCA during the day. Um, we already talked about throwing the spear or dart, so throwing weapons is an option. Um, and then they talk about leisure, pa leisure pastimes. One of the ones that gets brought up a lot is chess. Chess is an important game all throughout period. Um, it has been used as, as training for battlefield tactics and for um, leading armies. For, forever, um, definitely through the Roman period and before that, uh, it is it was very prominent and played played regularly in the courts all throughout Europe, particularly in 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 England, but but everywhere. Um, there is also some really good information and a couple of really good articles articles on academia for people who are interested about the introduction of the queen and and chess becoming a training and a metaphor for navigating court life where the pawns can take down a queen or anybody through indiscretion or through passing along gossip. And there was several people who, are, who have used both during our time period and, and after talk about using the, the chess as a metaphor for court life, which is a very neat and interesting concept to me. Um, so playing chess is very period. Um, at one time, uh, when I first joined the SCA, there was a lot of discussion about knights knowing how to play chess. And Castiglione obviously feels that that's something that all nobles should feel. And I would go so far with Hubi advocating it for anyone. Learning to play chess and playing chess at an event is perfectly period and a very educational and mind expanding prospect. Um, the other games that they that, that they advocate you play, which is not so mind expanding, but fun nonetheless, and one of my favorites, is playing at cards and dice. So during a time period when a lot of indentured servitude contracts for, for apprentices are saying, don't go to, 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 to taverns, don't play with dice, don't gamble, um, the courtier is actively advocating that you know how to do that and not just for money. In fact, you shouldn't be playing just for money, um, but because it was a pastime of the nobility and it was a place to interact with them and to be seen being generous and giving largesse and, and being well taken care of, which is the franchise. They also warned to be very careful not to complain about losing, that you should be joyful and, and having fun even if you don't win. And that it's important to to be gracious, particularly if you're losing to people who are your social superiors. Um, and as 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 a noble, if you have dependents or courtiers of your own, um, this is a great opportunity to spread wealth without paying somebody. I can intentionally bet above my above what is being put into the pot. I can do what's called betting my station. So everyone else is throwing in little, little silver coins or, coins or little copper coins, and I throw in something larger, bigger, or more of them, not to raise the pot, but just because I can. One, it shows my franchise, but it also allows me to pass money to the people who are playing in a, in a position that does not reflect poorly on them, like I'm giving them handouts or gifts or showing favorites, favoritism, but it also allows me to 
to help endear those people to me by giving something back to them. Um, gambling was a big pastime for men and women. Uh, particularly, uh, it was noted that Anne Boleyn and uh, Catherine of Aragorn both played cards and were well known for playing cards. Uh, the big scandal with, with um, Anne Boleyn about playing cards was not that she was playing cards or even losing large sums of money. Because if you look at the, the accounts accounting for uh, King Henry VIII and for his, his wife, Catherine, uh, they, lost a lot, they both lost a lot of money playing gambling. The, what the scandal was, was that, was that Henry was covering Anne Boleyn's gambling debts when they weren't married. So that was a, a huge scandal, but not her playing cards. And there is a lot of discussion, particularly in an earlier period, about it being unseemly for women to participate in that. Yet the courtier and Christine de Pissant's The Treasure City of Ladies specifically talks about that as a perfectly acceptable pastime, particularly when it's played for fun among people in the evening and not necessarily um, in taverns or bars. Um, one of the other things they would do in the evening, and um, there is a there are two books out that I have I'm desperate to track down. I, I do not have the names of them in front of me. They are both talking about parlor games, and this was the th this was where they would sit and tell stories or describe locations that they've been to, kind of like little travel logs. So it was entertaining the the gathering in the evening by telling a story. Um, our most brilliant examples of this is, of course, the Decameron. And in the, the 16th century, the Heptameron, um, that was a French work. And then there is also a French work called the Fractious Knights, which takes place at the very end of the 16th century, beginning of the 17th century, where, again, they are telling it is a, it is a series over the course of a week where each night a different lady is responsible for the entertainment. And they organize dancing, they organize music and singing, and then they organize a stor storytelling where they tell the story or they have somebody else tell the story. So these are, are great ways of spending an evening and things that the SCA is very familiar with. Our bardic traditions come right out of this. Um, sitting around as a group, sharing songs and singing, um, both singing together, and, and performance pieces are extremely period. Um, sitting around and telling stories. Um, like I said, the, there, there is one game about parlor games where the, the author is done a, a study of different types of games and has collected 16 different types of story type games that had rules and setups for it that were described that would be played during this time period in the 16th century, but also through the 17th century and into the early 18th century. So there is a lot of, of things taking place in the evening besides just getting together and drink and besides sitting around the campfire singing songs. Um, the dancing was part of the evening entertainment. Uh, some places would have professional musicians but in the book of the courtier, Castiglione specifically talks about people getting out their instruments and playing and singing and other people dancing for entertainment of the people participating, but also for entertainment of those not participating and watching. Um, there are, of course, examples of professional musicians and people who were very good musicians who were also part of the artists that would attend some of these different functions and participate in courts. Um, again, if we look at Anne Boleyn, uh, her courtiers included a musician, and they included uh, uh, gentlemen who were willing to fight for her, as well as different paid positions in her court. Um, and all of those made up the court that took care of her and how she spent her evenings. Um, and it would include ladies of, of, of her entourage and ladies-in-waiting who would participate in these activities as well. So small gatherings of dancing is just as period as doing big balls. It's just a way of, of participating in the evening's entertainment. 
both for yourself and for the enjoyment of those watching. Now, one of the things that I want to point out here again is not everybody needs to know how to do everything. Um, not everyone's going to know how to dance or can dance. There are people who, who physically are not capable of doing dancing. That's okay. There are people who cannot play instruments or don't know how to play instruments. Um, people pay me not to sing, so it works out very well. I, have other, I do other things for those evening entertainments, storytelling and things that are active participating in the evening's activities for the enjoyment of others, particularly for your no, noble and, and or prince. So those are things that we, we can discuss. Um, does anybody have any opinions on the difference with the evening? Oh, and somebody had uh, in the chat, looks like they just, it just popped up on the bottom of my screen. Looks like somebody had posted about the parlor games and, and about the book. So thank you very much. I'm going to go and take a look at that and see if I can track it down. Um, I've read, read a couple of articles where they've discussed the different games, but I've not had a chance to actually look at the book. So that is very cool. Thank you. Um, does anybody want to talk about about the the act about the other activities besides besides those of Marshall? Stuff is just as much a part of daily life as any of the Marshall stuff. In fact, it may be more of a part of daily life, depending on who you were and what your role within the greater society was. You know that uh, certainly for somebody that was a squire or an esquire, like in the later medieval period, that's a big part of their life. Yes, yes, and, and entertaining in the evening, both their entourage and as part of an entourage for someone else. Um, You've got a question in the chat that, that they're asking, how much other was reading aloud? I'm assuming, you know, because everybody couldn't read, how right. much of that was an issue? Um, to be honest with you, they don't discuss that much in the book of the quarter because they're assuming everyone reading that book can read. Um, one of the things that we'd point out is by the 16th century, particularly later in life, uh, most of the guilds were teaching people to read. And we have lots of documentation that there were women participating in the guilds, even in England where women didn't have a lot of rights. Um, there is a great book called Cross-Dressing the Middle Ages, which is in Cross-Dressing in the Renaissance, which talks specifically about women taking on the guise of a male persona and joining the guilds under a man's name wearing pants and, and participating. Everybody knew that that wasn't a man, and yet they met all the forms and everybody looked away. And then we have lots of examples after they were masters of suddenly putting dresses back on and taking their own names and, and being a woman again who is also a master of a guild. And that happened a lot. And there's, there's a couple of really good books that discuss it in England and in France. And in France, it happened a whole lot, um, but but so it. Although they don't discuss sp anything about readings particularly, I don't see why that wouldn't be an activity that they would do. Particularly as there were already um, works of fiction and novels such as uh, the, the the Rose and several other books that and uh, uh, the Romance of Roland and, and the, the Madness of Roland. There's no reason that that couldn't be part of the activities. Um, those books were all widely available in our period. Um, they do not discuss much in the list of the courtiers about what works they were reading themselves. Uh, what we get, what we can get from the. Okay, so it's raining. So bear with me just a second while I take myself and my camera inside my house. So, so that so that we don't have a problem with with that, um, but it'll only take me a moment. But anyway, the hey, Philippe. Yes. Uh, while you're relocating yourself, and just to kind of keep the conversation going while you're busy juggling, uh, I, I thought I might mention something to that uh, point that was made about literacy. Uh, not directly applying to England, but at least in Italy, 
in the 15th century. I was just recently reading an article, uh, an academic article, and I don't have the title of it right in front of me, but it was concerning the impact of Leonardo Bruni on uh, humanism in early 15th century Italy. So here we're talking like 1400, 1410s decade, something like that, in uh, Republican Florence. And this, uh, you know, graduate student, this this PhD candidate who is writing the article, uh, made quite a big deal about explaining that there was a high level of literacy in Italy at that time, and of course that's almost a hundred years before Castiglione is actually publishing his book of the courtier. So I think we can fairly assume that literacy, at least amongst the uh, the merchant class, the middle class and up was more the norm than what a lot of us, I think, in the SCA assume. Yeah, the SCA covers a broad spectrum of time periods. And so when you're talking, there's a big difference in literacy when you're talking 1300s and 1300s, or, or, and particularly the ten, in, in the 10th century compared to the 16th century, where universities are not just for nobility or for the clergy anymore, you've got universities where wealthy merchant class are going. Um, prior to Henry VIII closing of the monasteries, um, a lot of the monks and a lot of the monasteries would, would teach lessons on reading. Um, you also have a lot of that staying uh, happening in France as well as in, in Italy. Um, one of the things that has been talked about repeatedly um, in some of the works that I've been reading lately is about women being educated at the universities. And although they couldn't apply to the universities themselves, a lot of times they were learning through their brothers or male relatives while they were at university, reading their books, learning their, what they were doing. And France and in England both, they, they actively talk about educating um, women in the courtiers, the female courtiers, um, because they need to know how, uh, particularly noble women, needed to know how to keep books in the state and everything else. So, yeah, the, the literacy was, was much more common, I think, in the later periods than what people realized. But there is still no reason they couldn't have been reading popular books at the time. Uh, the Decameron was available in print. Um, there were lots of storybooks that were available in print. Uh, the broadsides had all sorts of songs that um, it was very, what we think of as filking is period where there was a tune. A lot of the times they were dance tunes um, that may or may not have started off as a dance tune, but there will be lots of different versions for it. Um, my favorite is Heartsies, is an English country dance. Um, and there are at least three sets of words, one popularly attributed to Henry VIII, whether that really, he really did write it or not, is uh, something people with more education than me are still debating. Um, but it is, they're, they're, they certainly would have had access to printed material. They certainly would have, would have read to others if you were dealing with, with, with courtiers of, uh, of, on, on the lower station because, and, and now I'm rambling and getting off topic. Did that answer the person's question? Well, they were kind of talking about reading aloud. The only thing that I thought of that would occur with maybe regularity was like a passage from the Bible, like at church, at a service or something like that, where you're reading aloud, maybe something where some of the parishioners, they don't understand that or they don't have a copy themselves, you know, because you'd have a much wider, larger audience at church other than just nobles and merchant class. Oh, ab absolutely. Um, one of the things that we talked about in the last class and we'll bring up here because it kind of applies is everybody had courtiers. So I, I am a, a baron of the court and, I, and, and a peer and I have dependents who by default are my courtiers. Um, but even they would have, and particularly if you look at knights, knights have squires, but a lot of squires also have men at arms, particularly in the Middle Kingdom. And so my courtiers would have courtiers of their own and on down to, to, uh, to people who, who we would consider to be almost lackeys. Um, my, my favorite example is 
of a literary person, of a, of a fictional character for this is D'Artagnan from the Three Musketeers, because he was, he was obviously a courtier to, to the Three Musketeers. And they were courtiers to Treville, but D'Artagnan had his own lackey as well that, uh, that would bring his weaponry and bring his, and wait on him and do errands for him. So even D'Artagnan had a courtier and that courtier was not educated. So at some level, they may also be reading broadsides of popular, of what's happening in, in the world and, 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 different act and different things that are going on with, with commentary being made. So yeah, I, I'm sure it took place. I don't, there's nothing specific about it in, in Hobie's edition of The Courtier, but I can't imagine that wasn't happening. Anya has expounded on her question a little bit, and hopefully I pronounced her name right. I was thinking when people are doing fancy work, all one word, uh, one reads aloud. It shows up later. I was wondering if it was a pastime in period. So that may mean I'm not a late period guy. That probably means more to you than it does to me. Right. Um, again, I'm sure, it, I'm sure it was. I know that's what was happening in the universities. Um, they would be reading, the, their, their lectures were really going over specific books from antiquity on the subject that they were studying. And, and so they were reading them out loud as well as, as discussing them. So, and that started in the 1300s and went all the way through our time period. So the, I'm, I am sure that was taking place. Um, I, I'm very curious to look at the, 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 the book on parlor games and see if that's one of the ones that they are mentioning in there. Um, I would be surprised if it wasn't. Um, she says thank you. Excellent. And I'm going to see if I can see what, what time it is on my, on my phone, and it doesn't tell it's me. It's about three minutes to three. Oh, three minutes to three? Mm -hmm. Okay, are you on Eastern time or Central? I'm on Eastern time. So we've got. Eastern, okay. I okay, so. We're at least another half an hour if you want to go. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead, see if I can do this so I can read without, absolutely, can people still see me? Yeah, you're fine. You're good. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so let's talk about the big one. And, and this is, is the one that I think can help a lot of people most, because I get constantly asked as a peer, one of the questions I get asked the most is what are peer-like qualities? And if you ask 10 peers, you're going to get 20 answers as to what peer like qualities are. Um, however, Castiglione had opinions, and he wrote those opinions down, and they were in period, so they're as good as anybody else's. So let's talk a little bit about, about what he thought peer like qualities were. And um, his, his, his way for individuals to behave, he's got two different types. Specifically, he talks about personal behavior, about things you should and should not do. And, and he tends to preference some of these with saying in public. Um, and then he's also got the ways you should behave to your Lord or noble. So let's start with personal qualities first, because I got a lot of opinions on the second one that, that we will, that, that could take up some time. So one of the things he starts with early in the list of qualities of the courtier um, is they list, um, do not be a liar. They also talk about um, later in the book being very careful not to pretend to have answers to things that you don't know and do not make up answers to things that you don't know. And part of this was dealing with your credibility. Um, it is very important to, to, to keep your reputation clean and these were, these were specifically parts of, of that. Um, as, as peer-like qualities and as 21st century individuals that, that, that and I'm sure, I'm, I'm assuming that most of us um, are familiar with the scientific method, saying I don't know that is, is part of the scientific method. And there's no shame in that. And I think it's particularly important in the SCA to say I don't know, or to ask qualifying questions. 
we'll, we'll take the question on literacy that we just had. That answer changes drastically whether you're talking about the 10th century or the 16th century. And so it's when, when it is more important to, to give qualifications to your answer than to say that's not period or that didn't happen. Because it, in the SCA, we have such a mix of cultures and time periods that it probably did happen some, for some person somewhere in our time period. It's a matter of, of to what degree and how. So those type of qualifications are, are important. And that's something that, that Hobie and Castiglione weren't about. Um, one of the other things they talk about is that all your activities should be towards a merry end. And I want to talk about that one for a minute because that one's a little, little more ambiguous. And yet I think it's important to, to focus that they're telling you that you should not be publicly doing things that is going to be with the deliberate end of being of, of being disgruntled or causing trouble. That if you are doing activities, even if it's giving somebody advice that they're not going to want to hear, it should be about with a per with the purpose of of merry intent, of give of of improving things, not hurting somebody's feelings, not being deliberately trying to bring down a crowd. Um, again, that particular line is open for interpretation, but that is something that I have found, and it's it comes up again in several places when dealing with your prince or noble about keeping things light, keeping things positive in public. Um, as a modern person, I was always taught that 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 uh, praise should be public and criticism should be private. Um, and I think that applies very strongly to the SCA. And I think um, Hobi and, and Castiglione would have would have agreed uh, if I if I may be so bold as to put words into their mouths. So um, the other things that we're talking about under personal qualities get kind of ambiguous. There are two in here that that I didn't know where to put. I'm going to put them under 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 POQs and personal qualities because this is something that comes up in discussions with, with, with people on a regular basis, and that's appearance. Um, one of the things Castiglione does talk about in the Book of the Courtier, and is specifically mentioned in the qualities and conditions in Holby, is, is calmness, calmness of dress and uh, merriment, merriness of your accoutrements. So we talked already in the martial activity that it says you should have scarfs, scarfs, scarfs of bright colors and surcoats and spiffy looking armor to, to, to be dazzle people on the field. He also talks about wearing somber colors when attending court of the current fashion and looking nice. Now we're not talking about being trendsetters and particularly if, if you, you want to take pains not to outdress uh, your patron, or particularly the king and queen, that's always uh, bad. But it is an important thing for him to talk about appearance. And and so we'll talk about dressing your part. Um, and it's kind of like our discussion with the gambling on betting your station. It is about how to behave as a noble and about that knightly virtue of franchise that is always so hard to to pin down. Um, still applies in the in the 16th century, but we've now talked of it about about your personal your personal qualities of how you behave to others. Dress well. If you have awards, you should wear your awards and show your awards. If you if if you have if you are attending court, you should dress for court. And if you are playing out in the field during the day, then you should dress appropriately for that. Don't. Don't feel like you have to wear your best clothes when you're running around in dirt. But, but at the same time, if there's court, you should dress for court, even at a camping event. Um, again, we're talking about opinions, but we're talking about things based off of the period manuals giving advice on how to behave towards these people. Um, so does, before I launch into dealing with, with your king and queen or your patron, um, does anybody have any commentary about the personal behavior or, or, or clothing? So 
myself if I unmute myself. I know our modern aesthetic, like we tend to match things. Was that something that they did? Because I know early period stuff, if I had a bunch of different colors, I would wear all the different colors and they don't go together, but that's just the, that was their idea of things as opposed to out. Yep. And at the, the beginning of the 16th century, the lens connects are still doing it. Um, your wear your best stuff wear your best hat wear your best doublet wear your best pants and if those don't match well that's okay um the nobility you see a lot in a way it's like a form of conspicuous consumption because if i can have really bright yellow and really bright red i can show that i can afford all the dye stuffs to have different colors absolutely um that's the whole point of wearing your your jewelry too you'll see people we have this concept that we'll have silver jewelry that matches particular outfits. We've got gold jewelry, and we have sets of gold jewelry and sets of silver jewelry that match specific outfits. They mix and match because they wanted to show off their finest pieces. And you really wouldn't, if you were going to court, you wouldn't wear your second best outfit. You would wear your first best outfit. And if that didn't completely match everything, well, that's okay. Um, now, for the nobles, and a lot of these paintings, you see things that more match, but you'll also see them in sets. For example, with this, and I can't address the female clothing as much because that's not what I study. Uh, but the male clothing, you'll see pants and doublets that are of the same material that match or complementary colors. Um, and then you've got the hat, the cloak, garters are all of a matching out, a matching color scheme or matching fabric, um, because. The accoutrements matched, but not necessarily were the same colors and not even necessarily complementary colors to, to the doublet and to the pants. Um, and then the jewelry was what you had is what you would wear. Um, and some, particularly the nobles, wore a lot of it because they could. Um, with dealing with, with the, the, lower, the lower classes, um, a workman, a, a laborer, may not have any jewelry at all. Um, we see some of the uh, some of the serving people with with a little jewelry or wooden jewelry. We starting to have a ring or a silver ring is or a pewter ring is a big deal. Uh, pewter was the 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 jewelry of middle class. It wasn't the jewelry of peasants, um, particularly in the 16th century. So having metal jewelry at all was a huge thing. And you would show that off because like you said, conspicuous consumption as well as showing my status in life is improving. And you, there are some sure laws that you've got to be careful of because those were a serious thing. But we also, also have lots of court cases of people paying fines to be for breaking those some sure laws. So they, particularly in the 16th century, they were a little more fluid than than I think some people think, but they were still a big deal and they were still important. And wearing the best stuff you had is important. Um, so there was a story that, that I'll, I'll devolve into here for a second of a courtier for Queen Elizabeth who um, was well loved and she gifted him her gold queen from her chess set and he had it made into a pendant so that he could wear it around his neck and shield it off because he loved it. And he got into a duel and killed for it um, because some people didn't like the fact he was flaunting the queen's uh, favor. So yes, you would wear your best stuff. Sometimes you have to be prepared to, to defend that action. Anything else? We're not, we don't have any comments at this point. Okay, so let me go to the, to the last topic I have, and that is for dealing with your, your king or prince. So as we've talked about, the courtiers are all up and down the social scale, uh, particularly in the SEA, if you are an attendant to a baron and baroness, um, that is a big deal, and you should behave accordingly. And Castiglione, and particularly, um, Obi spends a lot of time breaking breaking that out and, and making them bringing them up specifically in his list of qualities. There's about five or six of them that are towards the end, and what they are 
what they say in a nutshell is, is respect. Um, these people are in a position of authority. If we are going to be attendants to them, then we should treat them with respect. And they said what a ser servant is required to their master. And I'd like to, to talk about that for a second because none of us in the SCA are servile. None of us are paid attendants. We are there to have fun too. But for some people, particularly those on the Pelican track or Pelicans, service is an art form and service is something they enjoy. And there, it's a two-way street. They should defer to the wishes of the people they are serving. And they should be, be given word fame and should be given patronage by the person who they are attending um, so that people know what they're doing and people can see their good, the, these individuals' good qualities. Um, I have been a landed baron, and as a court baron, I have a lot of people who want to come and talk to me and do things for me. And as a patron, you have to allow them to do that. That is part of what they do. It's part of how they have fun. A knight, I have seen knights be chastised by the squires for not allowing the squire to do their job of carrying their armor or doing what they need to do. Um, those are real jobs, and people in the SCK take those seriously. So not only if you take those roles, should you do those, do those roles and be serious about it, but you should also, as, as the patron for that, um, allow people to do that job because that's an important part of what we do in the SCA. That makes it real for a lot of people. Um, at the same time, the courtier is very clear in Castiglione's model that they are not servants. These people are not paid attendants. So although they talk about giving the respect that a servant gives to a master, they are not talking about a paid position. They're talking about somebody who's doing it voluntarily for love of that individual, or if you're using the Machiavelli model for betterment and advancement of yourself. Um, and it could be both. So one of the things that we get into at the SCA is is with the servant, we want to be careful that the people, that we treat the people serving us as individuals, such as servers at feast and people at troll and water bearers and things that are providing a real tangible service to us, that we treat them with respect, that we make sure we acknowledge what they are doing is important, and that we make sure that we acknowledge their contribution to the activity. Those aren't things we should take for granted because they'll stop doing them because they're under no obligation to do those, just as we are no under no obligation to serve the people who are a higher station than us that we are supporting. Does any of that make sense to people? Oh, it definitely does to me. I mean, you know, like you're saying, everybody is doing things of their own accord and, uh, it'd be really different if all those people stopped doing all the stuff that they're doing. Like you would really, you have no idea how much you would miss that. Absolutely. Um, one of the stories I've already always been told, and I've not actually seen the inside of the crown, so I don't know, but I have been told that the original crown of the West Kingdom had a saying inside of it says, you rule because they believe. If we stopped doing these service functions, the society would fall apart. Our nobility would have no place to play. We'd have no place to be great lords and ladies. It would disintegrate. We have to have that infrastructure. We have to have those people helping, or we don't get to do what we're doing. So it's important. Um, but I also wanted to make the concept that we both are at the same exact time. Everybody who's watching this is a patron and a servant to somebody else who is giving them patronage. It's not a one-way street. It is a continuous flow. So um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. I was curious what your thoughts were. Like, okay, let's take the SCA, for example, that you could pick any three knights that have squires, and they probably have a different expectation of what the job of squire is. You know, for some people, it's very specific some it's more nebulous that you know oh, just you just need to kind of help me out how much does that reflect the actual medieval mindset were were all the different lords were they more uniform as to what my job as a squire is or was there lots of 
width and breadth, and people are somewhere on the scale as to what they want or don't want as a Lord. So it, it was a wide variety uh, by my time period. By 16th century, when you st start looking at like um, for the, the different guilds, they're not doing personal fealty anymore. They're writing indenture contracts with set requirements for their students of what I'm going to give them and what they provide for me. And so you're now looking at, at legal contracts that are enforceable in courts for, the, for this behavior. And there's lots and lots of court cases of, of people suing because they didn't follow, because they didn't believe one or other party followed the, the letter of the contract. Um, you see a lots of different contracts. Several of the contracts that, um, that I use for my apprentices are based off of um, musicians indentures where they were where they were indenturing to a master musician for playing at parties. So this was a, a, a band that was put, put together, but it was a person who brought in people who he was teaching the music industry to and, and musical theory to. And because of that, he treated them appropriately. They may have made, they may have, most of them were getting, in a, getting a stipend, an allowance, for lack of a better term, for, for what they were doing. So yeah, there was a lot of, of variant in that. Um, there was a lot of variant in, in how to play a courtier to your no, noble. And when we talked before at the first class, when we had the conversation with the three different models, Castiglione's model of how a courtier should behave to his prince is very different than Machiavelli's model of how a courtier should behave to his prince. And they both are attempting the same aims. They are both looking to achieve the same goals, and yet they are using completely different methods of doing it. Um, so, so yeah, there was a lot of variety about it, and it's all legitimate, but all of it boils down to, Machiavelli would say, give the respect due for, um, for personal reasons so that you, so you don't lose the patronage of this individual. But also Castiglione, in addition to that, felt that it was, um, the great chain of being is, is one of those things where the people who are in stations above you are supposed to be there. And it's perfectly acceptable for you to give them deference for what they do. Um, and for the SCA, our nobility is pretty fluid. Our kings and queens change every six months. There are a lot of dukes and duchesses out there. There are a lot of counts and countesses. Um, there are a lot of baron, baron, of baron and baronesses. Um, and they do a lot of things. And a lot of times there are reasons why they got those titles. And, and so showing respect to them until they, they show, until they have shown worthy otherwise is, should be, according to Castiglione, should be the two things. Um, but yeah, uh, like we said before, every peer you ask is going to, have a different view of peer-like qualities and relationships between dependents and peers and, and, and probably several different conflicting views if you talk to them more than 10 minutes. So, uh, so I really have reached the end of what I intended to do for this class. Let me talk just a moment about what I'm intending to do for future classes and what my goals for this series is. And then we can talk, up, and then I can open this up if anybody has specific commentaries or questions that they want to bring up um, or opinions on anything. The, uh, so my, my goal with this is to have a series of lectures going probably about once a month. Um, this is the third one that I've done. Uh, the first two were the same class because of, of, of technical issues. Um, this is the second part of the class that really is still just the introduction. We've not even dove into the meat of things, talking about specific activities and how those apply. Um, and I would like to. Um, I'd also like to do an in-depth look at, at the, the conditions uh, of Christine de Passant's The Treasure of the City of Ladies, because I think we've got a mindset in the modern era that women didn't really participate in this, and that is perpetuated by some of the Italian works on the subject that wasn't true universally. Um, you've got a strong tradition of women owning property in France, a um, hundred years before the, the Book of the Courtier. You have um, them, do, them holding courts for women and, and women courts 
as well as being participating in in the, the courts and affairs of the men and the rulers at the time, both in France and then you see it a lot towards the end of the 15th century, 15th century in England and the beginning of the 16th century. Um, if you look at Anne Boleyn as a model of a courtier, she was she she would she was a a woman who played cards and dice. She she was a woman who knew about political affairs. She is a woman of opinion. She was a woman of property. She was also a woman who had uh, who would go hunting with the men during the day and and did archery. It was not as one. It was not as completely one sided as as some works would make out. And I think it's important to spend some time uh, going in depth in that book as well. I also would like to, to start taking a look at some of the books that were being studied in the universities that were the books that were being read that the opinions in the Book of the Courtier are based off of. Um, there were a lot of, of ancient manuals, uh, Roman manuals that were being written, Greek manuals that were being referred to in the Book of the Courtier as proof of why these were appropriate and, and important. And one of the things that I think we can do to better understand what was happening and what decisions they were making as we can take a look at their education and what they were reading and basing those decisions off of. So I'm looking at trying to do this as a, as a, uh, a monthly class. Um, even after RUM, if RUM decides to not support the, this venue uh, ongoing, because it's a lot of effort on their part, we really appreciate them doing this. This has been very cool. Um, this is something I'd like to see continue even after that, um, where we are discussing about the courtier, both in either using the, the book club model or doing a, a roundtable discussion on specific topics. So if that is something people are interested in, please let me know. If you have preferences about what the next one should be, please let me know. Um, I'm gonna try and get, the, get a date scheduled for that soon. Uh, Rama is going through the end of June, and I know those are booking up fast, so um, I would like to get at least one more with the rum, if, and more with the rum if they are doing them after that. Um, but continuing these nonetheless, um, this is a good format and I've been enjoying it. And I want to thank everyone who has come and uh, participated and, and watched the class. Um, I also want to thank Rum not only for hosting these Zoom meetings, but for making the venue of posting these live on Facebook and posting them on YouTube, that has been phenomenal and has been a resource that a lot of people have talked about doing for a long time that RUM made happen. And we and other people, other organizations in the kingdom and other SEA groups are using that as an example, making that happen as well. And they're following RUM's lead and we appreciate everything that RUM has done. So, I will open oh, people want to unmute their mics if there's any commentary questions or opinions on the subject that we've been doing it is all open and welcome we've got until 2 30 my time 3 30 eastern time and then we have to to make way for other classes hi i just have a comment about um when you were talking about jewelry um, you're talking more about metals, and then there's also the antlers and bones and intricate carvings with that. Um, I noticed those um, specifically, uh, it was brought up in another class, and um, I just wanted to touch on that. Well, absolutely. Um, particularly when with the SCA, we're talking about a lot of different cultures, and, and even in, in the 16th century, during the Renaissance and through the Tudor and, and Elizabethan period, you're going to see a lot of bone and a lot of antler and a lot of horn being used uh, by by different people at different stations. And yes, wear, wear your best stuff always. I mean, I think people have a different, uh, maybe like a, a more modern idea. It's like, okay, gold is expensive and it's very shiny and stuff and silver is this, but I mean, at least in the Viking age, everything was on a silver economy, but it, it depends. Like I had this horn cup that I really like and it's intricately carved and stuff. And you know, just because something's horn, antler or bone, it can be beautiful. I mean, and it can show a lot of craftsmanship. It's just a different medium. Absolutely. And with the, uh, with, with when you're talking about artistic work, 
that's a whole nother thing all by itself. Art is is beautiful in and of itself. So even if it's if it's a horn, but like yours is beautifully carved, or the big drinking horns, or yeah. or or even wood chests that have got carvings in them or or or, or fittings, those are important. Um, one of the books that I like with the metalworking that I do is a book called the Museum of London's Dress Accessories. And they are finds, it's a great work. Um, and although it specifically focuses from the 12 to the 1400s, all of that stuff is still being worn and used during the Elizabethan period. Um, and a lot of it is, is pewter and brass and bronze. There's some silver, there's no gold. Um, there's like one pearl that they found. There's a couple of glass beads. These are things that we consider not to be expensive, but pewter was a hot commodity at the time. That was not, any metal was not, was not something light. And when you start looking at the, the number of, of uh, bone, ivory, and wood combs that they found in those finds, uh, wood combs are, are big. And those are, you know, ones made by a craftsman are going to be, are, are, if you're looking for conspicuous consumption, are going to be better than the ones you carve yourself at home. Um, unless you happen to be a craftsman, and then you should show that off. But at the same time, you know, if I have a plain wood comb that's not carved, it's probably because I don't have something. If I've got something better to show, I'm going to take that and use it. If I've got a, a beautifully carved wood, wood comb or a bone comb that's beautifully carved, I'm going to show it. I'm going to use it. I'm going to take it. So... So how many people understood like uh, self-promotion? Let's say I'm of the merchant class, take the stuff or not, but like, uh, let's, let's say I'm actually just a reseller, but I have craftsmen who make this stuff for me. A form of advertisement can be to care for me to carry my own stuff that I sell. And, you know, I'm showing it to people while I'm using it, but I'm, I'm kind of advertising it as well. Did they understand that as a concept? I mean, they're perfectly smart just whether they did things that way or not. I, I am sure they did. And, and, and again, it isn't brought up specifically in the book, but when you start looking at the patronage system, um, part of why, if I'm an artist, part of why I want this noble to, to wear my clothes or to, 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 uh, to, to display my paintings or my sculptures is because I want the people who are looking up to him to see what, what is being offered and bringing their trade to me. Um, so it certainly is a self-promotion. Um, some surety laws were there because people were constantly trying to raise themselves up above their station by what they owned and what they were displaying. And the some surety laws were, was a way to protect so you could tell who was of a certain class and who wasn't. Um, but wearing those clothes that are above your station is all part of self-promotion. It's all part of saying, look at how good I'm doing. You want to do business with me or you want to know me because obviously I'm doing really good for myself. Look at my clothes. Um, you got a comment from uh, Daniel Smith. He says, I would be very interested in a class on the educational background for the courtiers that you mentioned. So you've got a thumbs up for somebody who's interested. And okay. for, for my own point, I would, to be interested as well. Excellent. Well, that, and, and that is something I definitely want to, to start looking at then. And we, we, we might be able to do that for, for the next one or, or down the line here real quick. Because um, I, like I said, I do want to do more of these. And it's an, it is a topic that doesn't really end as far as information. While, while I'm giving one last chance for people to type up or to speak up, I will say thank you again for attending. And I hope you got information that was was useful. Um, any opinions or questions, please feel free to email me as well. Uh, I'm going to post the links to my Facebook page, and you can private message me there, or you can email me at mandretta at yahoo.com. Um, and more than willing to discuss this, one of the things that has been suggested that we were going to do at Gulf Wars this year, which didn't happen, or so hopefully at another war is do an evening where we will have a discussion where people come bring your your alcohol we'll sit around the uh the, the fire and talk about our opinions on some of these subjects and kind of the same way they did in the book of the courtier 
Um, and those salons, I've seen several of them done. They are very nice and it gives a nice venue to, to delve into some topics and to delve into some topics that are specific to the SCA as well, which I feel we need venues to discuss. So if, unless there is any other commentary or questions on the chat, okay. Everyone have a nice evening, enjoy the holiday and uh, be safe, uh, wash your hands, wear a mask, and uh, I will hopefully see you all very soon. <laughs>